Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. We've had a little bit of a break. We'll get right into it. We want to finish covering periodic motion, uh, at least for the most part, before Thanksgiving. Uh, the, in fact, our next exam is going to be before Thanksgiving. So actually, our our fourth exam will be a week from today. So keep that in mind. And of course, we'll have a, a review class the Wednesday or the class period before our exam. So this next Wednesday, we'll have a review. Friday will be the exam. And, and so that'll cover periodic motion. So periodic motion, traveling waves, standing waves, which we'll cover today. Uh, as well as uh, as well as Monday. So periodic motion was mass on a spring and pendulums. So any type of back and forth cyclical motion, as well as as waves and standing wave waves, which we'll cover today and Monday. Uh, so I'll have those uh, exam study resources uh, available uh, as soon as possible, so you can get uh, started studying on for that exam, but the exam will be on, on Friday. Uh, so we'll have our exam uh, that Friday before Thanksgiving, and then I don't have uh, any, any assignments or lectures planned for the week of Thanksgiving so that you can, you can plan your, your holiday uh, accordingly. Um, so keep that in mind as, as we move forward. We'll be you know, today's topic is sort of a continuation of traveling waves. So, so I guess it's been a full week since we met last met in lecture. So a reminder might be helpful. So last Friday, we covered traveling waves. And so traveling waves in, in particular, they're characterized by, uh, you know, a wave type disturbance through some material. That disturbance has a speed of propagation the speed of the wave. And that's in terms of a characteristic length of the wave, its wavelength, and a time that it takes or, or a frequency of oscillation, a time it takes for the wave to complete one cycle. That time is a period, and the one over the period is defined as, as the frequency of, of oscillation. And so we had, we described traveling waves just in terms of its wavelength and frequency, but we also described traveling waves in term in mathematical terms. We we saw how we could use a sinusoidal function to describe a traveling wave, and how the mathematical coefficients embedded within that sinusoid actually tells you what the wavelength is. It tells you what the frequency is. Uh, that the mathematical formulation tells you all the relevant information about that wave. And so today's topic um, is standing waves, which are certainly uh, in contrast to traveling waves. But if you understand traveling waves and the, the fundamentals of wave interference, so of course, wave interference is that you have constructive or destructive interference, where if the waves are in phase, you'll have constructive interference, meaning that they add together. But if the waves are out of phase, you'll have destructive interference, meaning that they subtract and you might have a zero resulting wave motion due to the fact that you have waves that are continuously interfering with one another. Standing waves are a result of wave interference. And so we'll be looking at traveling waves, specifically traveling waves in a confined space. And when waves are in a confined space, they reflect off of the boundaries. And after they reflect, they return back uh, in the same direction they came from, and they interfere with themselves. And under certain conditions, though those interference patterns, if again, if you have the right conditions, meaning you have the right frequency, you have the right length of confined space, uh, you can, under certain conditions, you can have standing 
waves arise that result from the interference of traveling waves. And the primary application of, of standing waves will be musical instruments. So in particular, stringed instruments, such as uh, a guitar or the, the strings on a piano. Uh, those will be applications of standing waves on a string. And, music, and wind instruments, uh, wind instruments, such as a flute, a saxophone, or any brass instrument, such as a, a tuba or a trumpet, those type of wind instruments, those instruments, musical instruments, operate by creating standing waves within the instrument itself, producing a note. And of course, those are standing waves in air. So we'll look at you know two different materials, two different media, uh, either just a simple string or, uh, or air itself. And if you're in my lab section, you, you've certainly seen this already, which will be, so in that sense, it might be a little bit of a, a review, but it certainly doesn't hurt to, to see it again. So we'll study those two materials, either just uh, a, uh, an ideal string or air and see how uh, standing waves will arise in the presence of, of a traveling wave. So clearly the the string has to be vibrated somehow, or you have to uh, generate sound waves within the air. Once you generate those waves, then they be then under certain conditions, they can form a standing wave. And if a standing wave arises, a, a note, a musical note is produced, and that musical note has the same frequency of, of oscillation as as either the string or or the or the frequency of oscillation of the standing sound wave within the musical cavity. So this comes from chapter 17 in the OpenStax textbook. Uh, we'll first look at uh, standing waves on a string and then we'll move on to standing waves in air. Standing waves on a string will be slightly easier to visualize. Just as a reminder from last time, we'll be reusing two equations from last time. Uh, the two equations were the general wave uh, wave velocity equation, so just defining the speed of propagation of the wave in terms of wavelength and frequency. And of course, for a wave on a string, the speed or velocity of the wave on a string is explicitly calculated in terms of the tension force and the mass density mu of the string. So that was an equation that we introduced. Those are two equations I will reintroduce last time, uh, but we will be reusing them this time. So to visualize, well, to see standing waves, uh, specifically standing waves on a string, I can show you a video, a video I also showed uh, in my lab sections, uh, where any length of string, and so this is, you know, obviously an ideal case, but you can uh, carry this type of analysis to a musical instrument, a, a violin or a guitar, or any type of instrument that produces a musical note by vibrating a string. And so when you vibrate this string, there's an oscillator on the left hand side that produces waves on the string. Uh, it simply vibrates up and down and that generates uh, wave motion on the string. And if the input frequency to the string, if the, the waves that you put onto the string uh, are of a certain frequency, you're going to have standing waves on the string. The, uh, if, it's, if the frequency of oscillation isn't tuned correctly, then you won't really have any significant, you will still have some vibration, but you won't have any uh, you know, net standing wave, and so you, you won't really have any uh, any note produced. And so if your frequency is chosen correctly, you'll have a standing wave, and that standing wave, uh, one type of, one mode of a standing wave would look like this. You can see you, you sort of have two parts that are, you know, they don't have the characteristic of a traveling wave. You can really see the disturbance traveling through the medium. It just looks as if the the wave is stationary and it's vibrating up and down 
where you have constructive interference and it's simply a node, a stationary node where you have destructive interference. And, but that even though the wave appears to be stationary, uh, we'll see in just a moment how that stationary appearance is the result of, um, of traveling waves that interfere with themselves. And if you look at it in slow motion, you can see, you know, it sort of still has a wave behavior, uh, but it's really just vibrating up and down, you know, in, in its maximum amplitude in, in some places, and then it's really not vibrating at all uh, in other places. And depending on what frequency you choose, you can have different modes. A standing wave will not always look like that necessarily. A standing wave could look like this, right? And when it looks like this, this is in fact the, the natural frequency because that's the type of oscillation that will arise if you were to simply pluck the string and allow it to vibrate uh, naturally. And so that's a mo that's a type of standing wave, uh, but it's it's in a, the simplest mode basically because you know certainly if you were to pluck it it would just vibrate back and forth and so that would be the simplest type of standing wave and it also will correspond to the natural frequency uh, in terms of a musical instrument. But if you were to drive uh, a certain frequency on the string, you can you can generate different standing modes. So this is even a higher mode. Uh, and these higher modes can only be generated when you actually apply a certain frequency to the string. If you were to play a musical instrument, a musical instrument will only ever play, well, a stringed musical instrument will only ever play uh, the note that corresponds to the natural or fundamental frequency of the string. You can't actually uh, play these notes by, by plucking a string uh, because the only way you can generate uh, these particular standing waves is by actually driving a higher frequency onto the string. And so if you increase the, high, the, the, way, the frequency of the wave that you're putting onto the string to a higher and higher degree, you'll get higher and higher standing wave modes, meaning that you get more of these regions of constructive interference. So you can, so again, in slow motion, but if you continuously increase the frequency, you continuously increase the number of standing waves. Uh, it, it's only standing waves that will produce the, the musical notes. Because even if you're, you know, singing or, you know, or something, you know, producing a musical note with your own voice, that's more than just a sound wave that's traveling from your mouth. Uh, when you sing, you're actually generating a standing wave uh, in your windpipe, and that's what actually produces the note, not just the sound wave itself. So it has to be a standing wave to produce a, a musical note. So how we can understand how those standing waves arise is, a, is, a, is with this uh, simulator here, uh, which I've used before. And we used it to visualize traveling waves. And so certainly a traveling wave, we, we understand the, the uh, propagation of a disturbance that we can visualize as a traveling wave. Uh, and so a traveling wave is when, you know, it just continuously travels in one direction. But we, we have standing waves when we have wave interference. And, and so to, uh, to generate wave interference, we want that wave uh, to interact with itself. So rather than having just a no end on one side, if we change that end to a fixed end, what we'll see is that uh, a wave that's traveling through the medium, the string in this case, uh, the wave that's traveling through the string uh, will reflect off of that boundary and return in its original direction of motion. So let's just first do a pulse. So a wave pulse. Um, and so that wave pulse, it hits the boundary and then reverses direction and then returns in its original direction. So when it hits that boundary, it'll reflect 
back onto itself. And if it was a continuously oscillating wave, it would begin to interfere with itself. We just have a single pulse. And so a single pulse uh, isn't long enough to interfere with itself. But if we have a, a wave that's being continuously generated, we'll see that when this wave reflects off the end, it will begin to interfere with itself. And we see that interference as a standing wave. We can see, you can see we have portions where the wave uh, is simply oscillating up and down. And, and once, you once you begin to have many waves interfering on the string, it, it doesn't become a, a nice, clean standing wave. And that's because you have to have just the right frequency to have a nice, clean standing wave. So if we look at that again, we have the traveling wave, it reflects off the boundary. And with the first reflection, you can clearly see these, 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 uh, these regions where you have a standing wave. You have constructive interference where the standing wave is oscillating the most. And then you have regions where you have destructive interference where uh, the, there really is very little uh, oscillation of the wave. And so that's how a standing wave arises. A standing wave arises from multiple traveling waves interfering with itself. And so we have a, a certain set of pictures that uh, help us visualize and describe standing waves. So for standing waves on a string, so kind of what we um, mirroring what we saw in the video, uh, we have the very first standing wave mode where the string simply vibrates up and down. And if we increase the driving frequency, so if we increase the frequency of the wave, the traveling wave that we're putting onto the string, we can realize higher standing wave modes. And so we have the, the first mode, the second mode, third mode, fourth mode, and those can continuously increase as long as you continuously increase the driving frequency, the frequency of the wave that you're putting on the string. The first mode is called the fundamental frequency. And the reason why it's called that is, is because it's the, the natural frequency that a string will vibrate at. If you're not actually putting on, if you're not driving a, uh, if you don't have a, an imposed wave that you're putting onto the string, it will just vibrate at its natural frequency. And its natural frequency is its fundamental frequency, just as if you were to pluck it in or were to vibrate back and forth. And so that's the, that's the mode that stringed musical instruments, that's the frequency stringed musical instruments uh, will will always play uh, because whenever you play a, a stringed instrument, uh, the way you change notes is, is by changing the length of the string. There's some sort of fret mechanism, fretboard mechanism that allows you to change the length of the string. And if you change the length, um, you'll still resonate in this fundamental frequency mode, but by changing the length, you change the wavelength of the standing wave. And by changing the wavelength, you change the frequency, the, the note that you hear. And so to quantify these pictures, uh, we describe the length of the standing wave in terms of its wavelength. So there's a certain length of string, and then we can identify a wavelength of the standing wave. So a wavelength is a complete peak and a complete trough. So if we look at the second mode, we certainly have a complete peak and a complete trough. And so the length would correspond to one entire wavelength of the standing wave. And then if we were to compare that against say the, the fundamental frequency mode, the length would only be a half of a wavelength and if we compare it to higher modes, uh, in the third mode, we would find that in that fixed length L, we could fit one and a half wavelengths. We could fit a peak, a trough, and another peak. So not a full two wavelengths, but one and a half wavelengths. And, and so on and so forth. So for the fourth mode, you can see we can, we can fit two full wavelengths uh, in that fourth mode. A string of length L. 
And so this relationship between the length of the string and the wavelength of the standing wave can be generalized in terms of the mode number m. And so that general equation simply looks like this. If you plug in any given mode number, you'll uh, you'll get these uh, any one of any of these length to wavelength relationships. If you plug in m equals four, you should get l equals two lambda. And that's certainly true. If you plug in m equals four, you get l equals two lambda. And so that's you know one key relationship equation there uh, that that will that uh, that will need. Standing waves in air uh, will use a similar visualization to describe the standing waves, although there's a big difference because waves in air are longitudinal waves, whereas waves on a string are, are transverse. And so the disturbance on a string, you can visually see by the position of the string. The string moves up and down, and so its uh, disturbance, its the direction of disturbance is perpendicular to the direction of motion. The disturbance is up and down, and the direction of travel is left and right. But in air, it's a little bit different uh, because uh, sound waves generate disturbances um, in, in a direction parallel to the direction of motion. So when, when a sound wave is generated, it's due to the fact that you, know, you have some vibration of something uh, anything uh, and that vibration vibrates the air and uh, that pressure variation or the, the change in the, uh, the position of the air molecules generates a disturbance that travels through the air. Um, this is one visualization to to, uh, to help you a little bit perhaps. And so the air molecules, when you have sound waves, when you have a, a, you know, a wave through air, the disturbance is in fact the, the pressure or what can be visualized as the distance between particles. As, as the particles move closer together, um, there'll be an oscillation that wants them to go back to equilibrium. And so sound, is is made of air and and so air is is somewhat elastic and you can change the pressure and so when sound waves travel through air uh, it's the distance between air molecules that's physically changing and that's the the disturbance uh, itself uh, and we visualize that we um, again in terms of a transverse wave so even though waves will be longitude. You can see, um, you know, in this column of air here, the sound wave would be traveling left or right. And the, the disturbance is also left and right, which is the distance between particles. The distance left and right uh, are the distance between adjacent molecules is, is changing. But despite that, you know, it's going to be easier to visualize it in terms of of some sort of transverse wave. And so that's uh, done in in this uh, in this first graph that the where a transverse graph is used to describe you know how the horizontal displacement of the particles or the horizontal position, the relative horizontal position is is changing in time. Uh, so we'll use a you know a similar diagrams to describe how standing waves in air arise, uh, but the idea is uh, is certainly the same, uh, where you'll have regions where the air the distance between air molecules is changing a lot. Uh, but you also have regions where the distance between air molecules is really not changing all that much. And so that, that still has the same uh, characteristic of a standing wave where you have regions where destructive interference occur and you, and you don't have very much disturbance. 
and you have regions of constructive interference where the waves, traveling waves, uh, will interfere in such a way so that their disturbances add together rather than uh, subtract to, to very little. And so the musical instruments uh, that will be uh, considered will be musical instruments where you have both ends open. So if you have like a, a flute or um, any type of wind instrument, um, even like a, a brass or a saxophone, those instruments can be modeled as simply as a length of air and you're vibrating the air on one end by, by playing the instrument, blowing into the mouthpiece. And of course, the, the other end is open to the air uh, where, the, where the, the sound exits. And so it's the, it's the same principle as the wave on a string. Of course, if you have one end open, that does change the boundary condition because recall that we understood um, we understood the standing wave to arise uh, at the reflection of a boundary. But even if, even if you have one uh, end open, so you know as you have as the uh, in a musical instrument, if you have both ends open, how can you have reflection off of an open boundary condition? Well, that's still possible uh, because it still is a, a boundary. Uh, and so you can visualize that as, as sort of a loose end. So not, not completely no end, not a fixed end either, but if you visualize it as a loose end, uh, what you'll see is you'll still have a reflection, although the reflection will be, you know, it'll look a little bit different as if it were a fixed end versus a loose end. So even if, even if you have an open boundary condition, uh, you can still have waves reflect off of that open boundary condition, as you can see here. And so even, and so the principle behind stand, you know, standing sound waves and instruments um, is still the same principle as uh, standing, standing waves on a string where you have a traveling wave that reflects off of a boundary condition and will interfere with itself. And if the frequency is um, chosen correctly, uh, you'll have, you'll have, you'll be able to produce a, a standing wave. And so with uh, both ends open, uh, you'll have standing wave modes that look like this. And so again, even though these are drawn as sort of transverse waves, the the blue waves that are drawn are indicating the variation in pressure. They're indicating are the air molecules moving a lot or the air molecules not really moving a lot. A lot. If you you know locations where you have a node means that there's very little motion of the air molecules, whereas the locations where you have the you know large displacement indicating that the molecules are vibrating at those locations uh, at, uh, and they're with maximum amplitude. Um, I have a question. How is this different? It looks almost exactly the same as the ones in air. Well, the equation for open on both ends, the equation is in fact the same, which is kind of nice, uh, but it does they do, they are different uh, because the boundary condition is different in, in particular. So you'll note the boundary condition for the string, you know, is fixed at both ends. But now the boundary condition, if it's open on both ends, the boundary condition is such that so that the particles are free to vibrate at those boundary conditions because it's a free, freely open boundary condition, meaning that the particles are free to vibrate uh, at the ends, whereas if it was on a string, the string is not allowed to vibrate at the ends because that's where the boundary conditions are. 
Okay, sorry. I thought this was like a different one. Never mind. I just confused it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it is the same equation. And, and so that's nice. But of course, it has a slightly different picture and a, and a slightly different physical meaning of what it's describing longitudinal waves versus transverse waves. And, and of course, the air pressure, rather than, um, you know, a transverse uh, disturbance. Uh, and so, so open on, on both ends is, is, a uh, is probably the most common way to model wind instruments. Uh, but you can also have instances where you have one end being closed and the other end being open. So uh, most organ pipes uh, operate this way, where you have, uh, you know, organ pipes, uh, you know, just is it just a long pipe where one end is open and the other end that is closed, uh, you have some bellows that's pushing air into the pipe and causing it to vibrate and it resonates at its fundamental frequency. Uh, and so we use a slightly different picture uh, when we have cases of musical instruments where you might have one end being closed. So, so uh, most commonly used to model some sort of organ pipe. So if you want to have one end being closed, well, that's a boundary condition. And so the boundary condition at the closed end you have to have minimal vibration since at that boundary condition there's there's not a whole lot of give at that boundary condition it's not um, it's not open to air like it is on the other end uh, on the end that's open to air certainly the air molecules are more free to vibrate back and forth and so we would have you know boundary conditions that reflect the ends being closed or open and so again we draw you know a transverse wave to conceptualize pressure variations that are arising from sound waves, standing sound waves in particular. And so if you analyze the picture in you know, a similar manner, relating the length of uh, that column of air to its corresponding standing wave wavelength, uh, you'll find this relationship between the length and the wavelength of standing wave. So like in the second mode, you don't have a full peak and a full trough. You have a full peak and only half of a trough. And so that would be three quarters of a wavelength. And so you can uh, go, go up in mode. And so these, these are the only, only ways that you can have a standing wave within that air column of, of that particular length. There's no way you can uh, you can have a standing wave in, in any other way. And so that, you know, in the context of organ pipes, you know, you'd have, you know, a, a sound frequency being generated at one end, and then it resonates through that pipe. And so you get this very strong resonant note frequency. That's a function of length. And that's why if you, you know, if you imagine, you know, an entire organ, uh, it has many, many pipes because each pipe has a different length and each length will correspond to just one single frequency um, where that uh, where that frequency will uh, be determined by one of these standing wave modes. And so the mathematical generalization of the relationship between length and wavelength for a column of air that's closed on one end uh, is is uh, is described mathematically by by this equation. And so for the mode number, say m equals one, you get two minus one, which is one, and so you get lambda over four, and so you'll get this equation as a function of whatever mode number. So you can you might have different mode numbers by, um, you know, if, if you if you apply, you know, a different sound wave to, to each of these, these air columns. And so those are the three 
primary standing wave applications that we'll see. And then of course, they're certainly applicable to musical instruments. We have waves on a string, such as any stringed instruments. Then we have uh, an air cavity that's open on both ends. So some sort of wind instrument. And then we have a column of air that's closed on one end. So most likely a, an organ pipe or, uh, or something that works on a similar principle. And so, um, so the main equations are just the, the general equations relating the length and wavelength, kind of understanding what that mode number is implying um, and that the mode number of one uh, will always be the, the natural frequency, uh, which will be the uh, frequency that uh, will naturally be played, um, certainly for a stringed instrument. Uh, when it comes to wind instruments, you know, typically, you know, you can't, you know, you can pluck a guitar string, but what does it mean for a sound wave to have a, a fundamental frequency? Um, you know, that isn't as well defined, you know, the fundamental frequency as it is for a stringed instrument. Uh, but we have relationships between the length and wavelength that uh, are slightly different, you know, for waves on a string and a column of air that's open on one end. All right, so let's look at uh, a couple questions. I didn't get a chance to completely write out the answers, but I uh, have uh, just kind of their the general format. So in question 98, we have a stringed instrument we have a, a violin. And so the string on a violin has a, a certain length. And so that string on that violin, if it were to be played at the given that length, it will play in its fundamental frequency. And so the fundamental frequency will always have a mode number of one. And we're also given the information that when that string is played, it plays a certain note, and that note has a frequency of 1000 hertz. And so any frequency will correspond to some musical note. If you're given a note, you'll always know the frequency. If you're, or if you're given a frequency, you'll automatically know the note. There's just a one-to-one -one correlation that you can look up there um, in, some, in some reference text, either Google it or uh, or look it up somewhere. We don't need to know exactly, you know, what note would correspond to 1000 hertz, uh, but we can use that information uh, to solve for uh, a few things. Um, so the, to determine the speed of the wave on the string, we know that we need to use the wave velocity equation where the speed of the wave on the string will equal its wavelength times its frequency. We know the frequency, but we don't know the wavelength, uh, but the wavelength can be solved using uh, this relationship that describes the different modes of standing waves on a string. So if we solve for the wavelength lambda, certainly the wavelength, just using algebra, we 2L divided by M. And the length is given as 24 centimeters. And so we'll, we'll naturally use base SI units, 0 0.24 meters, and the mode number is equal to one. Since we're told that the fundamental frequency is specifically mode number of one, or since we're given that it's the fundamental frequency, the fundamental frequency will always be mode number of one. So that equals 0 0.48 meters wavelength. And so we solve for the wave speed, wavelength 0 0.48, then a frequency of 1000 Hertz. So that equals 480 
meters per second. For part B, uh, you can use the relationship that for a wave on the on a string in particular, we know that this square root relationship is true, where in terms of the tension in the string and the mass density, that the, the wave on that string is a certain value. We solve for the tension force. So we get the speed squared times the mass density of the string mu. We solve for the wave speed, 480 meters per second. The, the mass density is the total mass divided by the total length. The total mass is 0 0.86 grams. The total length is 0 0.24 meters. So that's just the, again, the definition of the mass density mu is the, the total mass divided by the total length of a given string. So I get uh, 825.6 kilonewtons. Which seems uh, a little bit high. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's um, the mass uh, should be in kilograms. Yes, of course. Yeah, it's because this is grams. Yeah, that's going to make uh, that should make all the difference. Well, a certain difference. We'll get 825.6 newtons, which I think is still a little bit high. Yeah, so the mass certainly should be in, in kilograms. Uh, so the units of mass density should be kilograms per meter. So 0.86 grams will be 0 0.00086 kilograms. So you divide by 1,000. So I get 825.6 eight newtons, which uh, certainly is more reasonable. I think it's still a little bit high, but certainly more reasonable. So 831, you know, we're, uh, 831 is, stand, uh, standing wave on a string, kind of, kind of more similar to, uh, the, the video that we saw, uh, where you have a certain length of string, uh, the, string is being vibrated by some mechanical oscillator that's driving waves onto the string and you're given you know some relevant information about the string you're given its length you're given its mass density again in, in units of kilograms per meter so you don't have to do any unit conversion there 
um, this hanging mass on the end, which has given us two kilograms, that mass uh, is pulling on the string. And so that hanging mass is actually providing the, its gravitational weight is pulling on the string, which, uh, which is providing the, the tension in that string. So for the for the n equals six mode, that would correspond to you know a standing wave where you have you know six uh, standing wave uh, peaks. So determine so for this particular standing wave mode. What, uh, what, are, what would be the wavelength and frequency? Well, to determine the wavelength, you could simply use this equation where the mode number is given at six. length was one meter, the mode number was six. You know, I think, and I think in the textbook, they just use a slightly different notation for the mode number. Uh, so that's 0 0.333 meters. So I gave you the wavelength and to determine the frequency, well, to determine the frequency, you'll use the wave velocity equation where you can solve for the frequency because now you know the wavelength and the wave velocity can be solved for in terms of this, in terms of the tension force and the linear mass density. The tension force is the mass, which is two kilograms times the magnitude of gravity. So it's the gravitational weight of the hanging mass that's pulling down, it's exerting tension through the string. And so the tension in the string is equal to the gravitational weight of the hanging mass, which is two kilograms times 9.8. And the mass density was 0 0.006 kilograms per meter. Seven point uh, point two meters per second. Frequent frequency solve for frequency, velocity divided by wavelength. Look at our numbers. At 173.33 hertz. Uh, for part B, wavelength and sound. So, uh, so in part A, what we solve for is the, uh, the wavelength and frequency of the string. If we want to solve for the wavelength of the sound uh, in air, you know, we have, you know, we have for the vibrating string, you know, the string itself vibrates, but since the string is in the presence of air, the air is vibrating as well. And so the, uh, the frequency that this, the string vibrates is going to be the same frequency at which it's oscillating the air. And so if you were to hear sound waves from this vibrating string, those sound waves would have this same frequency, 173.33 hertz. Uh, but the 
the speed of sound, the, the velocity of the speed of sound is, well, it's the speed of sound. It's certainly not 57.2, which is the speed of the wave on the string. The speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second. So you could just uh, reuse this equation, solve for lambda. simply velocity divided by frequency. And so the velocity is 343 meters per second and the frequency is 173.33 hertz. So the wavelength in air would be calculated 1.98 meters. Certainly, if that you know string was producing uh, a sound, it would produce a note of of a certain frequency, and for a certain frequency and velocity, you can certainly also calculate its wavelength. All right, uh, we're, we're out of time, but I'll just briefly you know run through. Uh, these last two questions, because one of these questions uh, is a column of air that's open on one end and fixed on the other. And so the idealization is, you know, if you have uh, some sort of input sound frequency at the open end, and if you allow that sound to resonate, well, the, the frequency that you're inputting into the column of air is fixed. Uh, what you can vary, though, is the length of the air. If the if you have a, a level of water that can be raised or lowered at some particular length, you can you can uh, hear a, a standing wave resonance because at a certain length, the this frequency 1024 hertz uh, will will resonate, meaning that it'll it will become you know, much louder than it would otherwise be. Uh, and so if a standing sound wave is formed, that note will be much louder than it would be otherwise. Um, and so since it's closed on one end and open on the other end, uh, you'd be using this relationship that, that corresponds uh, to a standing wave in a column of air where one end is closed, one end is open. So you'd certainly use this relationship and you'll likely use the, the uh, velocity and uh, wavelength frequency equation as well. Um, in this particular question, uh, it also gives you the temperature of the air in the room uh, because the speed of sound uh, can be calculated in terms of air temperature, uh, but in general, you know, I'll give you the speed of sound. There is an additional equation where you can calculate the speed of sound as a function of temperature. Um, but in general, you know, uh, I'll just give you the, the speed of sound and, and you won't have to worry about calculating the speed of sound in, in terms of temperature. But that certainly is possible. Um, for the purposes of solving that problem, you know, it should be pretty easy to find the uh, appropriate equation. Well, not too easy because there are some constants that you need to look up. Um, you know, a, uh, a few constants that, uh, that are characteristic of an ideal gas, uh, but it's just essentially in terms of, of temperature. Um, so that question in particular, uh, certainly would require you to calculate the temperature in terms of temperature, uh, but I would just give you the, the velocity outright. And the last question, 91. You know, is an uh, is instrument that's open on both ends. So in, in question 91, it has uh, an oboe 
and it's and you're given the speed of sound. Um, and so it asks, uh, you know, what length should that oboe have to play a certain note to play a certain frequency. And so it'll be playing it in the fundamental frequency, the first mode. And so if you know, uh, if you know the frequency and the speed, you can solve for the wavelength because velocity equals lambda times frequency. You know velocity, you know frequency, you can solve for the wavelength lambda. And if you know the wavelength lambda, which is the wavelength of the standing air wave that's contained within the oboe itself, um, you can relate that wavelength of standing wave to the length of the instrument. And so you can, um, you can again, just use, you know, the, uh, our two of our primary equations, the, the wave velocity equation and the uh, standing wave equation uh, applied to, you know, a standing sound wave uh, for a column of air that's open on both ends. Uh, so that's kind of the, the context uh, and style of questions that uh, that will that you'll see this material be applied to primarily, you know, uh, certainly, you know, musical instruments, or, uh, or more technical, you know, waves on a string, sort of a more of a experiment type question rather than a true musical instrument, but you know, certainly it, it could be uh, applied to uh, musical instrument. So for number 130, like, are we just supposed to ignore the temperature and just use the, equ the equation that you have on the notes? Uh, yeah, you could. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you'll, if you were to calculate the speed of sound as a function of, of the actual temperature, you know, you'll get something that's very close to the nominal value, which is like 343 meters per second or so. So you'll get something very similar. It'll just be very different. So, um, so yeah, if you just use a nominal value of 343, you know, then, then you won't need to have to worry about calculating the speed of sound as a function of, of temperature since it'll, it'll just be slightly different. It just is an extra equation that, that could be thrown in there. Uh, but I haven't emphasized, you know, that, uh, that particular physics. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, well, we'll uh, end today's lecture there. And uh, we'll be, we'll be in touch. If, uh, if I get any exam resources posted, you know, I'll definitely let you know. Uh, but we'll be sort of continuing this, uh, this topic, maybe getting into uh, one or two new equations on Monday. Um, but we won't be covering too much more material uh, since we do have uh, the exam coming up. All right, so. Uh, have a good weekend, everybody, and I will see you Monday. Have a good weekend. Thank you.